Please put your hands together and welcome Andrew to talk about OpenStack. Thanks for the opportunity to talk to you today. Uh, I'm Andrew Howard from the National Computational Infrastructure in Canberra. Uh, what we'll be discussing today is our pursuit of high performance in OpenStack clouds. Uh, I'd like to thank my colleagues who contributed to this presentation, uh, Mohammed, Simon, Jakob, uh, Leif and Ben. Uh, I'd like to give you an overview of what NCI do and uh, how we fit into the picture, why we're interested in HPC clouds, uh, some of our past and present uh, cloud activities, uh, what we've done on the pathway to implementing an HPC cloud, uh, the topic of the day and this month, containers, um, some evaluation of MPI performance uh, under InfiniBand and containers, uh, and then, if we have time, any, qu any questions. So, for those who uh, don't know about us, um, the National Computational Infrastructure is world-class we provide high-end computing services for Australian researchers and universities. Um, we're the most highly integrated infrastructure environment. We run a petascale-sized supercomputer. Uh, we have a comprehensive and integrated expert service. Um, and we're nationally and internationally re renowned uh, for both our computational activities and our support team. We're national and strategic. We're driven by national research priorities and excellence. Uh, we're engaged with our research institutions, uh, performing collaborations, both in uh, research and in industry. Uh, we have the capability to extend beyond the capacity of any single institution in the sector. Uh, and we're sustained by a collaboration of national agencies and universities. NCI is critical to Australia because we enable research that would otherwise be impossible. Uh, we enable the delivery of world-class science. Our most critical aspect is the integration of big data and bringing compute and data together. Uh, and we attract and retain world-class researchers for Australia. Uh, NCI today, we run a 1.2 petaflop system uh, with uh, 57,492 cores, 160 terabytes of memory, uh, with 10 petabytes of direct attached storage. Uh, we also have an HPC cloud, uh, which is part of Nectar, and a shout out to our Nectar colleagues down here, uh, which is 3,200 cores. Uh, it's supercomputer spec, so we use the same hardware platform for our supercomputer and our cloud. Uh, and we also have around, uh, this slide's a little outdated now, around 30 petabytes of global integrated storage, uh, which runs Luster. That's backed by a number of 40 petabyte tape libraries. Uh, we use around two to two and a half megawatts of power draw. Uh, we serve researchers over the 30 universities, five national science agencies, and two medical research institutes. We've got about two and a half thousand users. Uh, we generate around 1,400 journal articles, which are supported by NCI services. Um, and we have we're supportive of more than $50 million of national com com uh, comp competitive research grants. So one third of the fellows selected for the Australian Academy of Science are NCI users. On our scale, uh, we're HPC and data infrastructure, which is around $47 million. We've got a purpose-built data centre uh, of around $24 million, and our recurrent costs are around $17 to $18 million a year. Uh, we're expert, agile, and secure. So this is part of our 900 square metre machine room, uh, our Rigen supercomputer, our InfiniBand switching fabric, and a number of our storage fabrics. We support the full gamut of national research, covering pure, strategic, applied, and industry. Our services, we're split into two groups. Services and Technologies, which is 30 staff. We provide the operations uh, of all of the infrastructure. Um, we're around 20 staff on that, plus four vendors' contacts. Uh, our HPC facility has around nine staff, our cloud around five, storage around five. We also are quite different from many other HPC facilities uh, in that we have a research, and engagement and innovation group. Um, this is made up by discipline-specific scientists who know and are able to speak 
uh, with our user community in the language that they understand. Uh, we run virtual environments for climate, weather, astrophysics, things like the sky mapper, geophysics. We also manage a number of nationally significant data collections, uh, which are critical for the publication, citation, uh, and data reuse amongst various science disciplines. Uh, we've also got a very uh, innovative team who does visualisation, and we have a, a product called Drishti uh, and Voluminous, which allow both web-based process, uh, web-based visualisation and direct desktop visualisation through a virtual desktop environment. I'd like to just mention some of these virtual environments and virtual laboratories that we operate. We're starting to move away from um, you having to copy your data into the supercomputer, schedule your job, wait for it to run, uh, to a far more friction-free environment of virtual desktops, where we utilise cloud capabilities in conjunction with our HPC capabilities to provide a consistent mix of research across the whole platform. We also run a shared science platform for shared science services. So we run a number of virtual laboratories across geophysics, geosity, climate, water, genetics. One of the key differentiators of NCI is our end-to-end -end data life cycle. Uh, a user will typically generate or transfer data into our system. Uh, one of our data management team completes a data management program and creates the catalog. Uh, the user then uses the supercomputer uh, or any of our cloud resources to uh, perform their research. They generate a paper uh, and they also publish the data, which is one of the, the key things. Uh, we're able to provide visualisation of that data uh, and also make it available for sharing and reuse in a secure manner. One of the uh, interesting things we've been working on recently is uh, a lot of work on Earth systems and environmental science data, particularly in the cloud. This is one of the uh, Nectar projects I mentioned earlier, which provides a virtual desktop infrastructure. Uh, users typically just log into that, use it as a local application, uh, are able to perform interactive analysis, code development, visualisation and also publication. On to our cloud initiatives. Uh, NCI has been doing cloud computing in one form or other since around 2009. Uh, we first started with a Red Hat OpenStack cloud uh, in 2013, which was a 384 core private cloud. Um, this was specified to be enterprise grade. It's typically used for our, was used for our virtual laboratory processing um, and has enviably had 100% uptime for the last two years. Um, we've also, since our initial uh, foray into OpenStack, uh, performed upgrades to Icehouse in 2014, which covered a migration from Nova Networking to Neutron. Uh, we also uh, upgraded from 10 gig Ethernet to 56 gig Ethernet. Uh, we've been using Ceph storage for some time, uh, and we scaled up the number of nodes from 32 to 100. In 2015, with our Kilo upgrade program, uh, we were able to use power efficiency to reduce idle load from 120 watts to 65 watts. Uh, with an electricity bill like ours, every watt we can save uh, is saving taxpayers money. We also increased the overcommit ratio uh, with little performance impact that we observed. Our Nectar Research Cloud uh, is a public cloud which is used for research across the Australian uh, education sector. It provides infrastructure as a service and platform as a service. Uh, NCI was one of the foundation nodes of Nectar. Uh, we're running this on an Intel Sandy Bridge platform, uh, which has 3,200 cores with hyperthreading. Uh, it's somewhat different from some of the other Nectar nodes in that we elected to use a fully fat tree, non-blocking 56 gig, gig Ethernet fabric, uh, which uh, will describe some of the performance characteristics of that. This had an, an initially higher cost, but provides us a very consistent network performance and flexibility in terms of being able to configure the I.O. operations on the system. Each of the systems is also fitted with a pair of uh, 400 gig SSDs running in RAID 0 
to provide 800 gig of local node storage. Uh, our Nectar Public Cloud has access to approximately half a petabyte of Ceph storage connected on the same 56 gig Ethernet fabric. So Nectar is delivering on-demand research computing for universities, research organisations across Australia. Our private cloud, which is what we call Tengen, most of our machines are named after Japanese gods, um, is our flagship cloud for data intensive operations. Uh, we use the same hardware platform as the Nectar clouds, but we operate in two zones, a density zone, which is, uses overcommit of CPU, and a performance zone, which has no CPU or memory overcommit ratio. We use RDO with Neutron under CentOS 7. This is architected to support both high computational and I.O. performance required for big data research. I've mentioned that we have local solid state disks. Uh, Tension has access to around one petabyte of Ceph storage and around 30 petabytes of Lustre storage. We use SRIOV with a full fat tree and 56 gig ethernet. Uh, and we've also got on-demand access to GPU nodes uh, within the Tension environment. Uh, Tension is also um, slightly different in its configuration in that it's federated with our NCI HPC environment. Uh, and I'll explain why that's important to us in following slides. Um, we've also done some experimental work with something we've called InfiniBand, which is a 50, bringing InfiniBand at 56 gig into the cloud. Um, this started on Icehouse uh, and then we've moved to Kilo. It's been heavily modified by NCI based on the Mellanox recipe. Uh, basically, what we use this is to present virtual functions. So an InfiniBand um, HCA is presented into a virtual machine as a local InfiniBand device. Uh, we provide InfiniBand PKEY to VLAN mapping. Uh, we, what we found is this provides near line rate InfiniBand performance. So once uh, we complete some of this work, uh, we may move Tension to native IB. Um, when InfiniBand's combined with InfiniCortex, which is a global InfiniBand extension running between peak HPC facilities, uh, we're also able to expand the cloud to national levels with near line rate performance at international scales. We're also doing some work on Docker and Rocket as our container systems. So this brings me to why would you actually want a high performance cloud? Um, the, if this works, no. So this is what's typically called the long tail curve of HPC, where a very large number of jobs only consume a single CPU core. But the majority of our heavy user workload is more than 16 cores. So we're kind of at a dilemma that do we schedule large jobs or do we schedule small jobs? One of the solutions we've come up with to solve this problem um, is to actually complement our supercomputer offerings to accelerate processing of single, jo uh, single node jobs. Um, we have a large number of these based on uh, a number of our workloads that we, we operate on behalf of our partners. Um, they're typically used for doing data processing, pre-processing, post-processing, which is also somewhat unsuitable for running on an HPC environment. Um, provided we're able to combine the I.O. capabilities that HPC offers, um, these jobs run far better in a cloud environment. Uh, we also run a number of virtual laboratories, uh, perform remote job submission, visualisation, serving research data to the web, providing on-demand GPU access, and where we really target this is at workloads that are, are not best suited for Lustre. Um, they're typically characterised by um, things like bioinformatics applications, which perform a large number of very small IOs as part of their workflows. Um, I've met, just mentioned the pipelines that uh, are not particularly suited. Um, we're also somewhat limited in terms of the dependency environment that we can run. We need to be absolutely stable to ensure uh, valid research outcomes. So we use the cloud for running proof of concepts, uh, for pre-staging, 
uh, and then actually running on the supercomputer. We also provide some, some form of cloud bursting capability, uh, which offloads those single node jobs to the cloud, uh, so the supercomputer super system can be better utilised. Uh, we also use this cloud for running uh, student courses, um, particularly on RDMA, remote direct memory access, which we'll describe a bit later. So combining the computation and data is one of the key aspects to NCI. Uh, many research workloads utilise very large data sets. Uh, by providing secure access to data in place, we're able to seamlessly combine resources across both our HPC system and our cloud systems without copying data into and out of the cloud. This is a, typically a very large pain point if we're using public clouds. Uh, we're able to migrate workloads transparently between our domains. So for some classes of jobs, uh, we can run them as efficiently on our cloud system in 16, uh, core confi uh, 16 CPU configurations as we can on, on the HPC system. It's just the larger jobs um, typically run far better on the specifically engineered HPC system. Uh, we can provide support for legacy workloads um, or emerging elastic workflows as they uh, present themselves. We're able to provide a wider, wider range of services to NCI users, things like GPU clusters uh, and Knight's Landing and, and these sort of things. Uh, and we're able to utilise the most appropriate and en energy efficient hardware um, to achieve the research outcomes. So this slide gives you some idea about the network structure that we have at NCI. Um, we typically run a, a 10 gig Ethernet network, uh, multiple 56 gig Ethernet networks, uh, and multiple 56 gig InfiniBand networks. We've got a specific storage network, an access network, and um, these provide a consistent environment across all of our systems. Some of the elements which differentiate HPC and cloud systems are the workflow, the communications architecture, whether they be InfiniBand or Ethernet. Uh, InfiniBand at 56 or 100 gig, which is lossless, full fat tree with a deterministic network latency and throughput. Um, or Ethernet at 10, 40, 56 or 100. Uh, and our ten, we use 10 gig typically for cloud presentation. RDMA, for those of you who are not aware of it, is a technique which allows uh, CPU, uh, the offload of data transfer without involving the CPU or without involving the TCP stack. Why are packet loss and latency important? Um, in TCP, a very small amount of packet loss can have a very significant performance impact. So it's critical that we're, we're measuring latency and packet loss. So on this exercise, uh, we started looking at what performance impact containers have. Um, some of the reasons that we're looking at containers is that they provide a research to the capability to provide us a calibrated workflow. Uh, we then combine the container with the data with some sort of access control middleware um, and that gives us a very good way to provide validation and scientific reproducibility of some of the research output. So what we were looking at is, can our traditional HPC level MPI applications run effectively within a container environment? How do latency and throughput compare to our baseline HPC? Uh, we performed some comparison of MPI RDMA in various environments, uh, in InfiniBand, Ethernet and uh, Rocky, uh, RDMA over converged Ethernet. Uh, and we were also able to encapsulate RDMA within a container and evaluate its performance in comparison to bare metal. So our preliminary results, and this just gives you a breakdown of the, the systems, they're pretty much similar, uh, particularly the Rigen and Tengen nodes use exactly the same underlying hardware platform. So this was all with OpenMPI 1.10, all applications were compiled using GCC, the clouds were open stack, Icehouse, Juno or Kilo, uh, and these are preliminary results uh, which are based on 10 runs where we throw away the top and bottom and just averaged it out. So with this, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Matthew Sanderson, who did the hard work to put the InfiniBand together, and he can explain some of these numbers. Thanks, Matt. 
Can you guys hear me without the mic well, over there? The the oh, all right, fine. Right. Yeah, thanks, Landis. Cheers. Hello. Um, so these are the OSU benchmark, which is one of several benchmarks that we ran. Um, basically, you can see the numbers for yourselves, I hope, but the interesting thing here is that as message size increases, you can see that performance converges to what is effectively very close to line rate. Um, so these are different. So these are the names of the systems, as previously described. Rocky is RDMA over converged Ethernet. Yalla is a transport layer by Mellanox. TCP, you all know what that is. Uh, InfiniCloud, as previously described, I think you said InfiniBand accidentally, no offense, is a native InfiniBand cloud. And you should all know what that is as well. <laughs> um, so this here is a container, a CentOS 7.2 container running in Docker, also on CentOS 7.2. You have to punch uh, holes in the container in order to get RDMA to work. So we didn't expect a big difference in performance there. And you can see it's very small indeed and disappears as you go up. The interesting jump there is the MTU. These are 9216 MTU, Mellanox HCA, HCAs, Connect X3s. Um, I think that's it. Next slide. How do I go next slide here? Help. Ah, clicker. Oh. Yeah. So you can clearly see the effect of uh, MTU right there. Yeah, so for those who don't know, so this is a uh, workload called Trinity, uh, consisting of three separate tools, which are effectively daisy-chained end-on-end, inchworm, chrysalis, and butterfly. It's a bioinformatics workflow. Um, this isn't a synthetic benchmark. This is a real-world tool that bioinformaticians actually use, well, one of many that they use. Um, yep, <laughs> next, please. <laughs> Yeah, I think this pretty much speaks for itself. So, yeah. These are well-known benchmarks. You guys can look up NEMD. Um, so, interesting thing here is look at the difference between containers and bare metal, which disappears, basically. So, there's not much overhead with running in a Docker container. Results are about the same with Rocket as well. Yeah. <laughs> So this is one of our uh, staff members, Benjamin Menergy. Uh This is his code, which uh, is doing Lattice QCD, quantum chromodynamics. Um, so this, again, is a real tool. Um, so this is interesting to me, the scaling going on there, which we understand. We haven't proven uh, this, but we understand that that's lack of NUMA awareness in OpenStack. Um, so the guest VM for this tool really wants to see the real hardware new topology, and it doesn't <coughs> at the moment, and that's something that we probably should be fixing. <laughs> you want to take over? Yeah. So uh, as Matt mentioned, NUMA was something that, that did bite us uh, when we crossed uh, multiple sockets, uh, and we're trying to use memory across multiple sockets. So it's important to just keep in mind that NUMA pinning and CPU affinity is, is quite important. Um, NCI is committed to HPC and high throughput cloud or high throughput computing in the cloud. Uh, we're engaged with many of our partners providing uh, high performance computing and high throughput computing solutions for researchers and we usually release these as open source. Two examples of these are our Slurm cluster which enables a researcher to quickly and easily spin up a cluster in the cloud backed by a Slurm scheduler, uh, and Rigen in a box, which is some of our work on running a mini HPC instance within inside Amazon. Uh, we're applying NCI's depth of experience in HPC application tuning to deliver high performance to researchers, a uh, secure computing in environment uh, in the cloud. We're bringing, HP we're bringing the cloud to HPC through our use of containers and dockers. Uh, based on a bring-your-own-workflow model with 
validated and calibrated workflows. So in conclusion, we can support seamless high performance research workloads with large data set access across multiple platforms. Uh, parallel jobs can run on the cloud, but is it HPC? Well, strictly not. The two environments have quite different uses. The cloud is suited for high throughput computing, easy provisioning and specific workloads, whereas traditional HPC performs very well under, with large parallel applications with MPI requirements. Um, selecting a common underlying hardware architecture shared between our HPC and cloud platforms uh, provides both operational flexibility uh, and also application portability and flexibility in providing a system in either role. Uh, as we mentioned, QPI and Numa can have a large impact on performance, particularly under Sandy Bridge, so make sure you're pinning if you need to. Um, single node performance is on par with bare metal uh, if the application is not uh, directly memory bound. Um, and as Matt mentioned, we are starting to look into the OpenStack scheduler uh, for locality aware scheduling, particularly with NUMA and network awareness. Um, and our benchmarks were limited by the QPI performance of Sandy Bridge. Um, we're planning to, to move forward to deploy bare metal using Ironic uh, to basically overcome some of these NUMA issues in the short term. So thanks very much, and we're open for any questions. Excellent. Round of applause. <laughs> so I, I, Andrew and uh, um, Matthew are two that you definitely worth having a beer and really talking through some of these things. I'm going to take, I, I, I like this supercomputing stuff, so I'm going to, I'm going to take uh, the host's privilege and ask a question. Does high performance computing need to be redefined? Or do you feel that uh, what you're speaking about with it, HTC, yes, it meets the use case, but do you see, especially in terms of usage pattern of your researchers, if they're kind of seeing performance in a different way? Come on up, and come on up, Matthew. Yeah. Well, it, it really, it really depends. And I mean, what I think we've both seen is that uh, your average researcher has multiple stages in their pipeline, and there's no one-size-fits-all solution. Yeah. And that's why Andrew was talking about the importance of having one shared uh, data repository that all of these different systems can feed into and get stuff out of. So I, I don't think. No, it doesn't need redefining. No, it doesn't, but yeah. it's only one part of the jigsaw puzzle, as it yeah. were. HTC, HPC, cloud. Mm. But I think it really comes down to, to energy efficiency for doing the job. Yeah, right. Uh, okay. Th th that's really the base cost. You know, how much is the power bill to run this to actually get your research out the door? Yes. So yes. if we can do it in a more energy efficient way for the same throughput time, the research is. That's kind of what. Okay. Very very cool. Um, also, the container stuff is amazing, but I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna sit here and I. The benchmarking, which Matthew just flippantly looks at and you know says, "Oh yes, we did all this benchmarking," is also is really incredible stuff, and not a lot of people are doing it. But questions from the audience, please, right here. Yeah, hi. I, I, I worked at CSIRO about five years ago. Well, that's when I left anyway. But it seemed that some of the problems that you have haven't quite gone away in terms of scheduling jobs and uh, having users write their jobs in a way that actually makes use of all of these cores. Um, so when I was there, you know, R was the flavour of the month, but they were starting to introduce things like concurrent Python and stuff, and I know that probably guys like yourselves were trying to push them in that direction. Um, so a lot of it's got to do with how they, how they write their jobs, obviously. Yeah. Um, has it improved, or they're still left in the darkness. No, we're seeing, you know, we're seeing a continuous improvement, but, you know, we've got to be aware that there's 30 to 40 years of legacy in terms of some of this code in some cases. So, you know, these are the things that fit nicely into a Docker environment where you can encapsulate all of those dependencies, run that workflow which has been validated, uh, and basically lock it in a box. Um, the, one of the differentiators, as I mentioned, is that we, we do have a really large user support team who are discipline specific and HPC experts as well. So that allows us to work with those sorts of users, educate them on the best way to actually improve their code, um, work with them on how to actually make full use of the supercomputer system. But for some jobs, it's just as efficient to run it on the cloud for exactly the, the points that you mentioned. One question right here. 
Hi, are you able to share any of the uh, learnings you've had from any of your security incidents? Probably not in this forum, but we could take this offline. Buy them a couple of beers, right? <laughs> That's the way it always works. More beer, more incidents. <laughs> <laughs> I like the 100% uptime that you had. Now, is that 100% uptime including time for upgrades and patching and stuff like that? So you do your upgrades and patching in line, or do you actually have 100% uptime excluding? So th this was a, a system that we've basically let sit at that version because it's mainly internal use and it's been running 100% for the last two years. Oh, a little round of applause for that. Well done. <laughs> so op OpenStack can be stable. That, that definitely counts for something. I'd like to hear that. One last question, then we'll go to T. I've actually got two simple ones. Uh, just wondering if you can share your overcommit recommendations for your CPU and RAM. And the virtual desktop infrastructure, was that actually to like the Spice virtual console or was it like an RDP session into the virtual machine? I'll hand over to Matt on the first yeah. one and I can pick up on the second one. So unfortunately, I don't have an interesting story for you for overcommit because at the moment, our, because we're running SRIV, there's a limited number of virtual functions per HCA. Uh, we're currently testing firmware which increases that, um, but that's hiding any other interesting limits that I think you're after, such as RAM or CPU or, or disk, and yeah. <laughs> um, sorry. <laughs> and there isn't room in our compute nodes at the moment to have two HCAs, and the, yeah, there's a firmware limit on how many virtual functions you can have, so I got nothing there. Sorry. <laughs> um, so our virtual laboratories are typically web-based, um, using a variety of different mechanisms to actually get that data out there. Um, we've probably got about a seven-year legacy of, of variant different ways of delivering to the web or virtual consoles, um, even some you know, older VMs and VDI-style um, remote desktop. I'd like quickly to mention the great tool Strudel, which I understand was developed by the Monash guys, which is part of our virtual desktop infrastructure, which works great for us. I, I think some of our guys made some enhancements to it, but that's a yeah, great Yeah, I did tool. see Steve Quinette is around from Monash. Yeah? Um, I don't know if Jericho is. Um, just to also recap, the, it really has been amazing. Um, in Austin, the scientific working group officially kicked off, and we have over 100 institutions now signed up and interested in being able to do these kind of jobs. And NCI and Nectar down here in Australia really have been world leaders in this. They were doing this, you know, four, five years ago when nobody else was, you know, they were in the Northern Hemisphere, they're still going through the global financial crisis. So. Um, it really is exciting to see that group grow. If you want to get involved, just do OpenStack and user committee and join the mailing list um, underneath the scientific working group tag. Uh, they just, just have minted a uh, new task force for being able to do more HPC atop OpenStack. Nonetheless, that's not to diminish the incredible work that NCI has done. So let's give them one last round of applause.